you have to do what you say you're going to do. And if you don't follow through, your business crumbles. And so that's why I think the skill of the century, especially for entrepreneurs, is the ability to be indistractable, the ability to do what it is you say you're going to do with your time and your attention. Now, I know many people say, oh, that's crazy. How can I plan my day? I need to be spontaneous. What if the kids need this? What if the boss wants that? Forget it. These are excuses. This is your mind telling you, oh my goodness, if I plan my day, I might have to actually do what I say I'm going to do. The only job of an entrepreneur, really, if you really boil it down, is prioritization. The problem is when most people use conventional advice of keeping a to-do list, nothing gets prioritized. Why? Because there's no constraint. So I'm not going to tell you how you should spend your time. What I'm going to tell you how to do is when you decide what's important to you based on your values, I'm going to show you how to make sure you do whatever it is you say you're going to do with your time. And now you have to watch our podcast. Welcome, everyone. Today, we are joined by Nir Ayal, best-selling author of several books, including Hooked and the most recent one, Indistractable, How to Control Your Attention and Choose Your Life. Nir and I actually first met in New York because we did a podcast for, uh, for my channel on the future of work. And now Nir is in Singapore. Nir, thank you for joining us. My pleasure. Thanks for having me. So this podcast is a little bit different. We talked previously about the future of work. This one is all about entrepreneurship. So the, we're going to be talking about slightly different things. But why don't we start with just a little bit of background information about you, how you got involved with all this stuff as well, because you are also an entrepreneur. Yes, yes. This is my third company now. Uh, the first two companies, uh, thankfully, were acquired. And uh, now we're on to the next thing. And uh, I didn't intend to be an author, but uh, I started writing essentially for myself. I started writing because I had questions I wanted answered. Uh, my second company was at the intersection of gaming and advertising. And I had this amazing vantage point to see how various companies use psychology to influence human behavior. Uh, I was in Silicon Valley during the rise of Facebook and Twitter and Instagram and WhatsApp and Slack and Snapchat. And I really wanted to understand the deeper, many of these folks were my, my clients at my last company, and I really wanted to understand how they were so good at bringing people back so that I could steal their secrets and use them to build various products myself. And so when uh, I wanted to start my next company, I had a, a very strong thesis that uh, the, the companies that would succeed in the future were the ones that build habits. Uh, but when I looked for, hey, where's the book on how to build habit-forming products? I couldn't find that book. It didn't exist. So that's when I started to do some research myself. I started talking to my friends at these companies. I started learning about how their products work. I spent a lot of time at the Stanford Research Labs and, and library there. Um, and then I turned what I was learning into a blog that I just started publishing on my own. And uh, soon thereafter, I got a, 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 an email from one of my former professors at Stanford who said, hey, I really like your model. I really like your work on this. What do you think about teaching a class together? And so then I became a lecturer at Stanford for many years. I taught at the Graduate School of Business and later at the Hassel Plattner Institute of Design. Then after a few years, I turned what I'd learned uh, from, from those years into a book called Hooked, How to Build Habit-Forming Products. And that book was published about six years ago. It sold over 300,000 copies and it's used in all sorts of industries to do exactly what I set out to do, which was to unlock these secrets so that entrepreneurs all over the world in every conceivable industry can build good habits with their customers through the products that they are using. Just like Facebook and Instagram and WhatsApp keep you hooked to their apps, what if we could keep people hooked to exercise apps and education apps and enterprise products? What if every product could be built in such a way that kept people coming back to use those products to build healthy habits, not just for frivolous games and social media, but actually for good behaviors that improve our lives? So that was my first book, Hooked. Uh, then, uh, a, a little while after that book was published, I actually started finding that I had to explore the other side of the question. So if Hooked was about how do you build good habits, I wanted to also understand how to build, or sorry, how to break bad habits, uh, and specifically this habit around distraction. Uh, because I found that, you know, these products that are so well designed that I wrote about, many of them were distracting me. Uh, I remember there was one particular instance where I was with my daughter one afternoon 
and we had uh, this beautiful day planned, just some quality daddy daughter time. And I remember uh, we had this activity book of all these different things that dads and daughters could do together. And one of the questions in this activity book was to ask each other, if you could have any superpower, what superpower would you want? And I remember the question verbatim, but I can't tell you what my daughter said, because in that moment, I thought it was a good time to just check my phone real quick. And when I looked up from my phone, I realized that she was gone. She got the message that whatever was on my phone was more important than she was, and she left the room. And mm. so I decided I had to figure out how to tackle this problem of distraction in my own life, because I'll be honest with you, it wasn't just with my daughter. It was when I would sit down at my desk at work and I would say, oh, I'm going to work on that big project. I'm not going to get distracted. I'm not going to procrastinate. And yet 20, 30, 40 minutes later, I still wasn't doing the thing I said. Oh, I we, we've been there. Happen. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. And, yeah. and as entrepreneurs, you know all about this. I mean, you know, because we don't take schedules, you know, entrepreneurs are schedule makers, not schedule takers, right? If you're an hourly employee, you take a schedule. If you're a schedule maker, you have to do what you say you're going to do. And if you don't follow through, your business crumbles. And so that's why I think the skill of the century, especially for entrepreneurs, is the ability to be indistractable, the ability to do what it is you say you're going to do with your time and your attention. Nir, so when you met Jacob in New York in December 2019, I was very pregnant and I was there. I don't know where I was. The, oh, I went to meet with my publisher. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. You were Jacob meeting with Hepper Collins. at your apartment. <laughs> We, were, oh, doing, the days we of, were doing a podcast and she was at uh, HarperCollins yeah. Studios. Yeah, and I was super pregnant. We actually have two kids and we have a five-year-old girl. Well, she's four and a half. So I think Jacob would probably relate to what you're saying. Yes. Um, and I understand that you live in Singapore, New York, which is so interesting. Can you share with us the structure of your team and uh, a little bit more about your business right now? Well, right now I'm... Um... I, I'm, uh, I just work with my wife, which is the two of us. We have a, an army of contractors uh, that we work with part-time, but no employees, just my wife and I. Uh, we've started several companies together. We've been married for almost 20 years now, and all three of the companies that I've been involved with, we've, we've done together. Um, so yeah, it's just us. What? It's kind of how, well, we're kind of the same. I mean, we don't have any full-time employees, but we, I mean, like you said, you have an army of contractors, right? So you have a bunch of people. But you know, we have to make this whole podcast now about working with your spouse. Like, why didn't we make that? Because <laughs> oh, yeah, like, we need some advice. We're I launching forgot. this business together. That's like the obvious thing that I, I forgot to ask. So you work with your wife. <laughs> we started doing this podcast together. So what, what is it like to work with your significant other? It's high volatility. <laughs> <laughs> Meaning, uh, for some people, uh, it doesn't work and it won't work and you shouldn't try and make it work. For other people, it's a dream. And um, I, 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 you know, the, a lot of things in, in my life, I can give advice uh, and I'll say, look, these are universal principles anyone should abide by. When it comes to becoming indistractable, I can turn pretty much anyone, unless there's some kind of medical reason why you can't do what I tell you. If you follow what I tell you to do in Indistractable, you will become indistractable. Just do what I tell you. There's 30 pages of citations to peer-reviewed studies. This is not just stuff I made up. I am religious about you know, looking for scientific tests, uh, texts to tell me you know, what's real and what's uh, you know, snake oil. And there is absolutely a bona fide way to become indistractable. When it comes to this question of how do I work with my spouse, I don't know if there are universal principles. Uh, I, I think my wife and I have a very special relationship um, that um, we've just been through a lot of ups and downs together and we are really good compliments to each other. So what she does really well, I don't like doing. And what I do really well, she doesn't like particularly uh, doing. And we don't step on each other's toes because I 100% trust her to do what she does and vice versa. Um, and we've just made it work over the years. And, and to be honest, I couldn't imagine starting another, you know, doing another venture without her. She's just, she's just awesome. She's, uh, she's my secret weapon. <laughs> I mean, she's amazing. Um, so but you, yeah, I don't know if I have principles for everyone. <laughs> that's amazing. So how do you guys split up? Like, what do you do versus what does she do? And maybe can you give people a little bit of insight? Uh, so we also work with a bunch of contractors. What do you use contractors for? How do they help you with your business? Uh, so I, I really focus on the research and the writing uh, and, and the speaking. So, um, uh, But what I do now is not actually really relevant because 
you know, to be, to, to be, to be honest, you know, we, we, we put in the blood, sweat and tears, uh, in our last two companies and we got a bit of financial security and, uh, uh, that makes it much easier to do crazy things like becoming an author. Uh, now that being said, um, this is really what I love to do and has been fruitful as a business. Um, but I don't really care about the money when it comes to my current business. I just, I just don't, I do it because I think this is important work. I want to solve my own problems. That's what I love about being an author. I get to write about whatever I want to write about. And so I choose to write about my problems, right? We, we, my friend Gretchen Rubin says, research is me search. Uh, and so it gives me an opportunity to go deep on topics that I struggle with. So I needed a book on how to build habit forming products and one didn't exist. I got to write it. I needed a book on how to, uh, how to be indistractable, how to choose your attention and control your life. I could write it <laughs> because nobody had written it before. Uh, so that's why I do what I do now. Would I give someone advice? Hey, you know, if you want to succeed, go be an author. No, you're just bad at math. <laughs> if you do that, it's a it's a ter it's a terrible business because it's uh, you know the odds of success are puny. Actually, the same with startups though, right? Like the number of startups that succeed. Uh, if you if you start a company, let me tell you, if you start a a, a startup uh, because you want to get rich and famous, you're stupid. The, the odds are stacked against you. You're just no. bad at math. You have to start a company because you have no choice. It's something that is burning inside of you. It's so much easier just to go get a job, just get a paycheck, right? To start a company is so freaking hard. You have to do it because you have no choice. Because if you don't do it, you will regret it. That's the only good reason <laughs> that, that it's a product that you need to see in the world for yourself, that you need to create, and it's going to kill you if you don't do it, then you should start a company. Yeah, mm -hmm. I like that. Yeah. Um, so we have little kids and a lot of our friends are also home working with little kids and it's not easy. Kids are struggling right now. They're scared, confused, depressed, lonely. And then a lot of parents like us are working overtime. And I like this morning I was making our daughter's lunch. She is going to preschool. That's a new thing in our house, which is a good thing. But I was making our lunch and Jacob's like, like you're, you're running around the kitchen. I said, I'm doing my job, my other job, which is being a mom and, and helping set her up. So do you have any advice for parents right now that are working from home with their kids or maybe the kids are in school, but they're still working harder than normal. Things are weird because of COVID. Do you have any advice yeah. on how we can feel a little less crazy by perhaps better time management tips? Sure. So, I mean, this is, this is the, the crux of becoming indistractable. Um, so, okay, so to become indistractable, there are four key steps, okay? The first step is to master the internal triggers, to realize that all distraction begins from within, right? The distraction is, it, we like to blame the stuff outside of us, the kids, the pings, the dings, the rings. Turns out, overwhelmingly, that's not the cause of distraction. The cause of distraction, by the way, what is distraction? Distraction is not the opposite of focus. The opposite of distraction is traction. Traction is any action that pulls you closer to what you intend to do, things that you uh, move you closer to your values and help you become the kind of person you want to become. So anything you plan to do with your time is traction. Anything else is distraction. So we've got traction, we've got distraction. We've got internal triggers, these things in, inside of us that pull us away from what we plan to do. So the fear, anxiety, loneliness, fatigue, all of these internal triggers, these bad feelings, that's the leading cause of distraction. Then we've got the external triggers, the things in our outside environment that can also lead us away from what we plan to do. So there are these four steps, essentially. Master the internal triggers, make time for traction, hack back external triggers, and prevent distraction with packs. That's the four overarching strategies. And strategy is more important than tactics, right? Tactics are what you do. Strategy is why you do it. So that's the most important thing to remember. Now, I want to get into the details because it sounds like you're like, okay, give me a tip. What do I do? Let me give you a life-changing tactic, okay? You have to plan your time. In this day and age, if we don't plan our time down to the minute, yeah. somebody else is going to plan it for us. Now, I know many people say, oh, that's crazy. How can I plan my day? I need to be spontaneous. What if the kids need this? What if the boss wants that? Forget it. These are excuses. This is your mind telling you, oh, my goodness, if I plan my day, I might have to actually do what I say I'm going to do. So, don't think most people out there are thinking, oh, this won't work for me. Work with me here. Think about why this would work for you. What would your life look like if you sat down and planned out 
what your day might look like. And this is particularly important if you have children at home, they need structure. Remember at school, they have that structure, right? They have the bells, they have first period, second period. We need, if your kids are homeschooling now, they also need that structure of how to plan their day. Now, why is this so important, planning out your day? And by the way, this isn't some you know new technique that I invented. This has been verified in thousands of peer-reviewed psychology studies. It's called making an implementation intention. It's planning out what you're going to do and when you're going to do it. It is way better, way better than the conventional advice to run your life on a to-do list. Running your life on a to-do list is been shown to be one of the worst things you can do for your personal productivity. <laughs> much, much better to keep a schedule and use that to-do list immediately, put those things on your schedule. If you wake up in the morning and you look at your to-do list, rather than your schedule, you've already lost, right? You're digging yourself into a ditch. Why? Because to-do lists are endless. There's always more. And so you're always thinking about all the stuff you could be doing. So even when you have time to be with your kids, even when you have leisure time, you're always thinking about all the stuff you didn't get done. And it's terrible for your psychological well-being rather than having that schedule. The other really important thing about keeping a schedule is that when you have a time boxed schedule, you can share that with your significant other. So back to what we were talking about earlier about working with your, your spouse, or by the way, you can use this technique with your boss or your employees as well. When you have a time box schedule, when you have a physical artifact that you can show people, here's how I will spend my time, you can do what's called a schedule sync. So we know the studies find that even in the year 2021, women take on a disproportionate share of household admin duties. By no. Far. Wait, I'm sorry, what? No. Yes. <laughs> what? We got, I we got a grind to give up this. We're, we're out of time, Nir. Thank you <laughs> yes. for joining us today. No, wait, this is, this, this is the, the meat of the podcast today. Okay, I exactly. love, love in hearing this. So what? So we know that. So we know that women during COVID have suffered. Like there was this article in the New York Times, like called the primal scream. I think moms could call into this number they provided and literally just let it rip, like scream because they're yes. so stressed out. <laughs> that's that's yeah, my interview. Yeah. Go on. <laughs> yeah. Okay. So yeah, I, I love how the, the men listening are like, uh, I don't want to talk about this right now. <laughs> and their women are like, yeah, okay, bring it. So this is, this is what happens. And let me tell you, uh, my household was ground zero for this problem. For years, my wife and I would get into arguments around my wife saying, you know, look, don't you see the garbage needs to be taken out? Don't you see our daughter needs to be fed? Don't you see all this stuff that needs to happen, let alone with our business, all the stuff that needed to happen? And my excuse was, honey, if you need me to do something, just tell me. What's mm -hmm. the problem? Just tell me. I'll do it. Well, what I didn't realize is by me asking her to tell me to do something, I was giving her yet another job. Now she was also my 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 uh, babysitter. Now she had to tell me what to do. I was giving her even more work. You're getting eerily so, similar to what's happening <laughs> in this house here. I know, I know, I know. So here's the solution. Here's the solution. You sit down once a week. It takes you no more than 10 minutes and you do what's called a schedule sync. A schedule sync involves looking at each other's time box calendars. You have to do this for yourself first. When you look at each other's time box calendars, you will figure out where the responsibilities are falling through the cracks. So now we don't ha just have a, a, a list of, hey, do this, do that. It's no, we understand when those things will get done because in a household, there are contingencies. If I don't cut up the vegetables, my wife can't cook the dinner, right? If it, 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 so, there's there's things need to happen in a certain order. So, what do we do? We time box these things. She knows mm -hmm. when I will get those things done. I know when she will get her things done. We know when so one person needs the car or when our daughter needs to be picked up from here or there or the other because we spend ten minutes a week doing a schedule sync. Now you can do this with your boss as well. What does it look like with your boss? I know we have many entrepreneurs, but this is a tactic you can adopt with your employees as well. You know, the, what, the, the only job of an entrepreneur really, if you really boil it down, is prioritization. Prioritization. And prioritization, everything else is details. If you can prioritize well, your business will succeed. Done. That's your, that's your only job as an entrepreneur is to prioritize. The problem is when most people use conventional advice of keeping a to-do list, nothing gets prioritized. Why? Because there's no constraint. You just yeah. add more and more and more. I want to do this, 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 and this. Whereas if you put it on a time box schedule, it forces you to say, wait, 
what's important now and what can wait till later because there's only 24 hours in a day. It doesn't matter how much money you have. Everybody on earth gets the same 24 hours in a day. And so we have to be judicious about how we spend that time. So whether it's at, in work, whether it's with your home life, that second step that I talk about in Indistractable about making a time box schedule and turning your values into time is an absolutely critical practice. I'm really curious. So your schedule, like how down to the minute you get? So for example, we struggle with this sometimes as well. Uh, pretty much a lot of the same stuff you mentioned, right? To the trash. And I say, Blake, just tell me to take out the trash. I'm happy to do it. Just ask me for help. I'm happy to help. Um, so how does that, tra I get like the business side, right? I mean, we share our schedules. So like I can see what Blake's day looks like business wise. Like I can see the meetings that she has. She can see the meetings that I have. And that's kind of like where it ends. But how does that translate into like chopping the vegetables, taking out the yeah. trash, like some of the other, other sort of like, do you actually plan that into your schedule, chopping vegetables? So what most people do, they start in the wrong order. What do I mean by that? So we have to turn our values into time. Okay, what are values? Values are attributes of the person you want to become. Values are attributes of the person you want to become. So what you have to do is to ask yourself, how would the person I want to become spend their time? starting with these three life domains. The three life domains are you, you're at the center of these three life domains, then your relationships, then your work. Most people do it backwards, right? They start with the work, then they let everything else fill in the details. And this is a huge problem, let me tell you. So my wife and I, we met in an economics class in college, that's where we met. And one of the lessons we remember, one of the few lessons we remember from our, our college days was this idea of a residual benefactor. A residual benefactor is the person who gets whatever is left over when a company is liquidated, okay? So when a company goes out of business, the debt holders get their money first, then the equity holders, then whatever scraps are left over, that's the, what the residual benefactor gets. And a few years ago, my wife turned to me and said, Nir, you have made me into the residual benefactor. I get whatever scraps of time are left over after the business, after the kids, after your friends, after your workout, then I get a little bit of time here and there. And she was absolutely right. I was guilty as charged. So we need to do it in the opposite order. First, we start with ourselves. We start with how would the person I want to become spend time for themselves? So I want you to take out your calendar and ask yourself to live out your values, to become the kind of person you wanna become, how much time would the person you want to become spend on themselves? What might that include? Does the person you want to become spend time reading, educating themselves? Is that on your schedule? We all have that aspiration. Oh, I should read more books. Is it on your schedule? Does the person you want to become spend time taking care of their physical health? If so, where's that time on your schedule for exercise? Put it on your calendar. Then after you've talked about, by the way, it can be fun stuff too. If you like playing video games, awesome. Put it on your schedule too. That's totally fine prayer, meditation, a walk, whatever it is that's that's good for you to do for yourself according to your values. There's nothing wrong with these technologies, video games, social media, nothing wrong with them, but do with them on your schedule and according to your values, not the tech companies. Then relationships. You know, we are going through a loneliness epidemic in this country, particularly uh, among men, because men don't make time for their friends. Mm -hmm. So men also, we need to put that time into our schedule, even if it's a phone call or a Zoom call, uh, something to engage us with our most important relationships and also with our spouses, right? Put that time for a date night or a walk together or whatever it is. That we have comes a date night on Saturday. Relationships. Awesome, excellent. So put that time in your schedule. Lastly, we have the work domain. The work domain comes after we've put in the time for you, for your relationships, finally your work. Now work, there are two kinds of work. We have reactive work and reflective work. Reactive work is how most people who don't get things done spend their entire day. Reacting to phone calls, reacting to emails, reacting to notifications, reacting to their kids uh, tapping them on their shoulder. That's reactive work. And everybody's day needs to involve some element of that. Everybody's job has some element of reactive work. The problem is most people make no time for reflective work. Reflective work, if you don't make time for it, what you're doing is you're spending your entire day running real fast in the wrong direction. Because it's only when you put time in your day for reflective work, that time to plan, strategize, be creative, you can only do it without distraction. 
So that's the order of events to ask, answer your question. First, we start with you, then your relationships, then your work, making sure we have time for reactive as well as reflective time. Hey everyone, it's Blake. And Jacob. If you're enjoying the show, please take a few seconds today to review our show on Apple Podcasts or wherever your preferred podcast platform is. All you need to do is search for BYOB Podcast on any platform and you will be able to find our show. And reviews like this are actually one of the most important things that podcasters like us can do to help grow the show. So we would really love and appreciate your support. And now back to the show. Near, so a lot of people that are entrepreneurs or successful, they get that way because they love to work. Like I figured out at a very young age, I lived in New York City and um, I my family wasn't around. So I just worked all the time and I loved it. And I realized, oh my God, this thing work, it makes me feel good. I'm good at it. It makes me proud of myself. But what do you do when you have kids and all of a sudden they need you and you can't do this thing that makes you feel so good because family has to be number one priority. So what advice do you have for people like us that, I mean, Jacob and I are the same. <laughs> I know I have so well, I'm going to speak for him that we love to work. It makes us feel good. It lights our fire. It raises our serotonin, to be honest. And at the same time, you know, we love our kids, but it doesn't like juice us up. Like we're it's hard like, to we stop. love Mondays as opposed to like loving Saturdays, even though we love our children. It's just how we're programmed. So yeah. what advice? And I heard an interview with you where you said that time man uh, pain management is time management or time management is pain management. And I thought of this, this idea that, oh my God, like I love working and it makes me feel good and it makes me forget any stresses or worries and focuses my brain. So what advice do you have for people like us that just love to work, but at a certain point it, it's not healthy and you need to balance your life and focus on your children? Yeah, well, I, I would start with your values and I would challenge whether it's necessarily the case that for everyone, family has to be first. You know, you, you said that yourself, family has to be first. Does it? Maybe. Well, who am I to say? I'm not going to tell somebody that that uh, work shouldn't be first. What, who am I to say that your value system needs to be only this one conventional way? So I'm not going to tell you how you should spend your time. What I'm going to tell you how to do is when you decide what's important to you based on your values, I'm going to show you how to make sure you do whatever it is you say you're going to do with your time. So that's why values are so important. You have to start with this limited resource of time and to ask yourself, how would the person I want to become spend that time? Meaning, how much time would the kind of mother or father I want to become spend with their kids? It doesn't have to be all day. <laughs> I, I'm not going to judge you if you say, you know what? Dinner every night is fine with me. That's told, I mean, if that's your values, if you, say, if you can look back on your life in 20, 30 years and say, you know what? I'm good with that. That's how I want to spend my life. I want most of my time to be at work because that's what's important to me. That's my highest values. This is my mission in life. I enjoy it. It's it, it, it's in, in accordance with my values. Fine. But do that in advance. The problem of distraction occurs when we use it as an escape from an uncomfortable reality. So just as people will escape into social media or video games or booze, right? People will do this with work especially entrepreneurs out there because they are looking to escape something, right? They have something to prove. They don't like their home life. They're escaping something and they're using that work as an excuse to get out of whatever it is they don't want to feel. That's when it's a distraction. When you say, I want to be one thing, I want to do one thing with my time and now I'm doing something else. But as long as you decide in advance, these are my values. This is when I, what, how I want to spend my time. There's no judgment there. That's absolutely fine. But decide in advance. Mm. Yeah, that's great. There's a big stigma against, I think, working women that they should, you should want to be a mom instead of want to be working. And if you want to be working over being with your kids, yeah. there's something wrong with you. So that's no. helpful. Thank you so much. Yeah, um, absolutely. Sorry. There's, no, there's no judgment there at all. I think I, I, I don't think there should be. It's, people just have different values. Mm -hmm. I want to get back to your four I, steps. Oh, sure. Go ahead. What were you going to say? No, I, I just think that, that that friction, that what we call this cognitive dissonance, I think this is really, really difficult, particularly for women, because there is a social stereotype that you should do this. You have to be that. You have to fit into this mold. 
bullshit, <laughs> right? Like any mm -hmm. kind of life you want to live for yourself is wonderful. But again, the only way to get whole about it is to decide in advance to say, this is how I want to spend my time. That's the kind of person I want to become. That's the only way you can minimize regret. What you don't want to do and what most people do experience is on their deathbed, they say, oh, I wish I would have spent more time uh, building a business. I never gave it a good go. Or, oh, I wish I would have spent more time with my kids. I should have you know, carved out more time for them. That's what we want to prevent. Don't, mm -hmm. don't think about this on your deathbed. Do it now. Decide how you want to spend your time today. Mm -hmm. So I wanted to get back to your four steps. We talked about the first one. So mastering the internal triggers, which as you said, it's not about the dings or the beeps. It's about your anxiety or the stress. So I suppose that has a little bit of, you need some self-awareness to understand why you're being pulled towards those things. Um, the second step was make time for traction. And then, so maybe we can start with step number two and go through two, three, and four, since we didn't touch on those yet. Sure. I, you know, uh, number one is actually super important to, to, to talk about too, where uh, we talk about these internal triggers. And I think most people don't, don't get this. When we think about distraction and procrastination, we only think about the pings and dings. Uh, and in fact, there's been studies that find that 90% of the time that you check your phone, nine zero, 90% of the time you check your phone, it's not because of an external trigger. It's because of an internal trigger, anxiety, boredom, loneliness, fatigue, uncertainty. That's 90% of the time you check your phone. That's why. So that's why, you know, back, back to what Blake said earlier, time management requires pain management. And if you don't understand that discomfort you are trying to escape for entrepreneurs, most of the time, it's uncertainty, right? That as entrepreneurs, we constantly feel, what, what, what am I supposed to be doing with my time? What's going on yeah. with my business? Are my employees busy? But those are feelings. That's not reality. That's a perception of reality. And so if we don't get those emotions under control, if we don't know how to master those internal triggers, they become our masters. And that's when we go off track. That's when we do all kinds of stuff, working our guts out on the wrong stuff because it makes us feel good. Let me give you a great example. How many entrepreneurs, we sit down in the morning and we say, okay, I really have to work on that proposal. I really have to work on that sales call. I have to really work on this and this and this. But first, let me check email. <laughs> right? It's Let me, me just check that it's email me. real quick. I'm the worst. I'm right. totally addicted to my email. I know Jacob's thinking. By the way, it. there I said Blake, it. <laughs> I'm giving you autobiographical information here. I wrote the book for me. Okay. I used to do the exact same thing. Why? Why do we keep checking this stupid email, even it's though we know there's nothing? Isn't it? It's not. It's the, it's well, the, it's the high you get. Okay. Let me, let me, I have to take issue a little bit. Okay. Don't make it about the brain chemicals, okay? Why? It's totally disempowering. Because when we think, oh, the brain chemicals are doing this to me, it's not cocaine, <laughs> right? <laughs> Serotonin and dopamine, these are not cocaine in the brain. That's not how it works. Uh, it is a desire to escape discomfort. Don't, don't say it's a serotonin. Say it's my, it's my desire to escape discomfort. That's what it, it is. I my pants. I've got ants the what? in my pants. Ants in my Ants pants. Ants in your pants. Mm -hmm. Exactly. Exactly. That's that's what it is. It's not because when we say serotonin or I'm addicted to my technology or it's the dopamine, it makes mm -hmm. it sound as if we're powerless. We are not powerless. We just need to take these four steps in our life. I promise you, if we if you implement these four steps, I've researched this for the past five years. If you use these in concert, you get rid of the ants in the pants, right? You get rid of the, the desire to escape discomfort. First, mastering the internal triggers, which there's all kinds of techniques we can talk about exactly what to do around mastering those internal triggers. That's the most important thing. That is the most important step because no tips and tricks, no life hacks, none of that stuff will work if you first and foremost don't know how to deal with that internal discomfort, okay? Mm -hmm. And by the way, it's not a character flaw. There's nothing broken about your brain. There's nothing wrong with you. It's simply that you never learn the skills to deal with this discomfort in a healthy way that leads you towards traction rather than distraction. That ants in the pants is a great thing if you can channel it into the right direction. It's a terrible thing when we try and escape it, when we try and let me just check email because I don't want to feel this way. I need to do something. Yeah. No, that's not good enough. You have to channel it toward doing the right thing. And that's the hard part. So if we have uh, maybe like 10 minutes left, what do you think the most important thing is to cover? Because I have to run and pick up our daughter from preschool. 
So good. You're, you're time and if you're a minute late, they, they charge you a dollar a minute and after five o'clock exactly. in a COVID, in the COVID world. So if we have, <laughs> and but thankfully it's like right next door, so it's not a big deal. So if we have ten minutes left, what do you think the most important thing is to cover over the next uh, ten minutes? Would it be focusing on the internal triggers? Ooh, it's it's tricky. I mean, it, you know, we want to focus on strategy more than tactics. And I know that sometimes can be frustrating for people because they're like, well, just give me the life hack, right? Like, what do I need to do? Uh, turn on like uh, grayscale my phone? What do I need to do? Like uninstall something? Uh, do I need to get a new app? It's not that simple. The, the reason is, is because it's about what's going on in here, right? Distraction is not out here. Distractions in here. And nobody wants to hear that because that requires some work that requires some self-reflection. Right. Yeah. But that is the most important thing. Here, you know, here's the one, here's the most important lesson. The most important lesson is that distraction and procrastination is not a character flaw. There's nothing wrong with you. It's that we, we, we haven't learned these skills and fundamentally it's an impulse control issue. Just like with our kids, if you have kids, you see how they don't have impulse control, right? They'll just eat the chocolate cake. They'll they'll draw with yeah. their crayons where they should. They don't have impulse control. They haven't learned that yet. Well, guess what? We are learning the same thing even as adults because we have all these bad habits that when I feel crappy, I reach for something. I reach for the remote. I reach for email. I reach for a drink to take my mind off of that discomfort. We have been habituated to find relief that way. So if it is an impulse control issue, the answer is forethought. So here's, here's if you want to summarize my work over the past five years, this is the mantra. The antidote to impulsiveness is forethought. The antidote to impulsiveness is forethought. There is no distraction we can't overcome if we don't plan, uh, sorry, if we plan ahead. Let me say that again. There's no distraction we can't overcome if we plan ahead. If you wait till the last minute, you will lose. If the cigarette is lit in your hand, you're going to smoke it. If the chocolate cake is on the fork while you're on a diet, you're going to eat it. <laughs> if you sleep next to your cell phone every night, it's going to be the first thing you pick up before you even say hello to your loved one. It's too late. You have already lost. However, if you plan ahead, if you take steps now, you can prevent getting distracted later. That's the key message here. And, and good news is, you can do it. Anyone can do it. Yeah. I'm curious to know, since you said that you were the first person to be interested in this because you suffered from these things, has the fabric of your life really changed since you realized that you were struggling with these things and then you unearthed all this research and you changed your habits and your, your living, your values? Has the fabric of your life changed? Blake, I cannot even express how much my life has changed. Uh, I have a better relationship with my wife that I've been married to now for 20 years. We have a better relationship than ever. I have a better relationship with my daughter. I'm more productive at work. I've written two bestsellers now and I, I, I publish every week that I never used to publish every week before. I'm, I'm cranking out more content uh, than ever before. Uh, I'm in better shape than ever. I'm 43 years old and I'm not saying this to brag, but I have a six pack. <laughs> <laughs> I used to be clinically obese. Okay, that's why it's such a big deal for me. I used to be clinically obese. And now for the first time wow. in my life, I've never been in good, this good a shape. And it's not a miracle, it's not willpower, it's consistency. One of my life mantras since writing this book is consistency over intensity. Consistency over intensity. That to be our best selves, we don't need to oh, burn ourselves out and go crazy, you know, like these weekend warriors who, uh, you know, uh, uh, people who uh, make a New Year's uh, resolution and you see them in the gym for a month. No, that's not the way you get in shape. You know the way you get in shape? You do a little bit of exercise every day for years and years, and that's how you get in shape. If you want to have a good relationship with somebody, you know, your children, you don't say, okay, uh, right now, let's spend six hours together and be friends. No, you build a relationship over years by consistently showing up when you say you will and being fully present with your children as opposed to, oh, let me just do this one thing while I'm supposed to be playing with you, right? To be to build a great business, you don't show up on one week and say, that's it, we're going to go IPO. No, you work for years consistently on that company to make it succeed. So it's all about consistency over intensity. But the only way to do that is to be able to focus your attention and control your time. This is how we choose our life. So one of the things I know, at least that I struggle with sometimes on day, for example, like today, yeah, I had a pretty open schedule. I didn't have a lot going on. Business is going well. I'm sitting there thinking like, you know, 
I should be doing something. And, you know, I wanted to like spend time doing chess stuff because I'm obsessed with chess. And so I'm like, that okay. Weird. Chess stuff is what? studying chess. chess. Studying chess. He has a home, his homework. He has a coach. Yeah, so I have like a chess coach. that I. <laughs> so I thought, okay, you know, I, don't, I have a pretty free day. I'm going to spend like three, four hours today doing chess puzzles and doing chess homework. And instead, I basically gave myself work to do. Like I found, <laughs> I found stuff that I was supposed to do. And I sometimes feel like entrepreneurs struggle with this where it's like, you have downtime and it's okay to relax, but you you find something for yourself to do. Has that ever been a challenge for you? I mean, what do you do in that situation? Totally, and let me tell you, I bet you very few people listening right now have ever felt what real leisure feels like, right? Very few people out there because so many people use this, these, this terrible technique of running their life on a to-do list. You know how much I hate running your life on a to-do list. And so what they do is even when they have the leisure time, like you did, they're thinking about all the work stuff. Hmm. Right? I, I didn't even have a to-do list. My to-do list was checked off. That's the thing. I had nothing on my to-do list. I was, I was exactly. creating a to-do list in my head. I was like, I got time. You know, I, I should think about another video I should do. I should think about uh, the next article that I want to write. You know, I haven't checked in with so-and-so in a while. I should, and I'm just like ad hocing my to-do list. Right, right. So it's interesting. What's underneath that, by the way, are feelings. All right, when you say I should, all right, you used to use the word should many times. Yeah. Why? What's the should? I don't know. It's a feeling. It's <laughs> guilt. It's uh, obligation. It's these feelings that we don't know how to do this. It's not reality. It's our perception of reality. And so that's why a time box calendar is so important. When you say to yourself, look, I am going to spend the next hour with my coach or two or three or however many hours you want to spend on it, that's what I'm going to do. That is traction for my life right now. I decided in advance that's how I want to spend my time. Anything else, even work stuff, is a distraction because it's not what I said I was going to do with my time. And it's only by doing that that we can differentiate because here's the thing. You can't call something a distraction unless you know what it distracted you from. How can we call something a distraction unless we know what it distracted us from? So the only way is to say, look, this is traction, the things I said I was going to do. Everything and anything else is a distraction. Hmm. I like that advice. Well, we have to uh, pick up our daughter soon. Unfortunately, I really I want to have you back on the show because there's so much that I want to ask you that we didn't have time for. The time box. I like the time box. Uh, it's incredible. Calendar. Maybe Just we... one quick question: Is that something you do digitally, or do you write it down with a pen? That's my last question. So, yeah, no, that's a, it's, a, it's a good. It's a very common question. A good question. Um, the best tool is the one you use. Ah. So whatever it is that you will use consistently, it could be a pen and paper, it can be a planner. Uh, I have a, a tool on my website. If you go to nearandfar.com forward slash schedule hyphen maker, I built this tool because I kept getting asked this question of like, hey, what should I use to get started? So it's at that URL. I'll say it again, nearandfar.com forward slash schedule hyphen maker. Uh, there's a free tool there. I actually use Google Calendar. Yeah, that's uh, so because easy. it, you know, I can just keep it from week to week to week. That's totally fine. And then, you know, the idea with these time box calendars, by the way, is that you make small adjustments from week to week. You don't set the calendar once and then that's it. It's fixed for life. You reassess it every week and you say, okay, where do I need more time here, less time there? And then you're you're revising it to make it easier to follow in the week yeah. ahead. And it's planned for you from nine to five or eight to five each day? 24 hours. <laughs> I even I even plan my sleep, right? Because there's wow. unequivocal evidence now. We all have heard ad nauseum that we have to get proper rest, right? Who doesn't know that we need proper rest for our psychological and physiological well-being? Uh, you know, if you have kids, you probably tell your kids you have to have a bedtime. But how many parents have a bedtime? Yeah, I didn't. <laughs> I was being a hypocrite. I was telling my daughter, you have to get on bed on time. And I knew how important sleep was, but I didn't have a bedtime. So yeah, now I have a bedtime. Okay. I'll give you one last hack that you'll love for couples out there. Okay. And, and now it's the end, you know, it's close to the end of the episode. We can get a little personal here. Let, let, let's talk about our sex lives just a little bit. Okay. So a few <laughs> years ago, I found that my wife and I, uh, we're getting to bed later and later, and we didn't have time to be intimate because she was caressing her iPhone and I was fondling my <laughs> iPad and we weren't being together. And so we decided, you know, I was doing this research and I found this one technique that I decided we should try out, which was 
the fourth step that we didn't get to today, with the fourth step is about around uh, preventing distraction with a pact, a pre-commitment, right? It's when we decide in advance how we, what we will do in a way that prevents us from getting distracted. So it's a firewall against distraction. So what do we do? I went to the hardware store and I got us a $5 outlet timer. Now this outlet timer will turn on or off anything you plug into it at any time of day or night you set. So in my household, every night at 10 p.m., the internet router shuts off. Wow. Right? Why? Because if I, uh, you know, if I go, if I, if the other three techniques haven't worked, the uh, mastering internal triggers, making time for traction, hacking back external triggers, if that fails, the last line of defense is the internet router shuts off. Right? Mm -hmm. So that solves our problem because the internet's off. That's it. Bedtime. Yeah. Now, now we don't even need it anymore. Now we all know, hey, 10 o'clock is when the internet router shuts off. But we took that step to make sure that, you know, if I really wanted to, I could unplug the router, plug it back in. I could turn, I could find a way back on the internet, but that's not the point. The point is I added a bit of effort, a bit of friction to doing something that I didn't want to do, namely keep scrolling as opposed to getting to bed. I love it. Well, thank you for it's sharing that hack. with us. That's very personal. <laughs> and I think our viewers and listeners will really appreciate yeah, it. No, it's a great piece of advice. Um, well, do you want to do the wrap up? Do you want to end? Yeah. You know, I feel like I've been talking so much. Um, Nir, so I know you mentioned your website. Can you share one more time so our entrepreneurs can come find you and download all those great tools that you've provided? Absolutely. It's nearandfar.com. Near is spelled like my first name. So that's N I R and far.com. And actually, uh, there is a, a workbook, an 80 page workbook that we couldn't fit into the final edition of Indistractable. And that's now it's available for download for free. Anybody can get it on my site, nearandfar.com. Uh, and, and you can have that, of course, you know, whether you buy the book or not, I don't really care. And it'll start you on your path to becoming indistractable. So make sure to check that out. Very cool. Well, Nir, this has just been so much fun. I hope we get to do it again sometime. Maybe even in New York, we can all meet up someday. Yeah. And uh, yeah, I'm going to definitely try the tools that you've shared with us today, really. So I really appreciate you being here. And all of you have been tuning in to the Be Your Own Boss podcast. Until next time, thank you for watching and listening. Thanks for watching our show. For more content just like this, don't forget to subscribe. And if you want to get access to more of these full episodes, you can always check out our website, byobpodcast.com. We'll see you next time.